here um, having a talk with one of my favorite people to talk to, who I could talk to endlessly, Jay, about um, community and community building and, and a topic called recommoning. And I'm going to let Jabe and Dimeje introduce themselves and um, kick off with our second keynote of the day. And thank you both very much for coming. Uh, thank you for having us, Diane. Uh, we're excited to um, come and talk to people. Uh, I, I wanted to point out just coming off of the last keynote that I watched, which was super interesting, that uh, Dimeje and I are not uh, directly involved with any of the communities um, that, you, that are coming and, and talking today. We're not uh, members of the CNCF or um, any of those other communities. So uh, our, our talk will be um, uh, based on some theory and some suggestions about how to, um, to use that theory. Um, any, any implied uh, criticism should, should not be heard because uh, we aren't aware of those communities well enough to critique them directly. Um, with that said, uh, I want to introduce you guys really quickly to, to one of my favorite people in the world, Dimeje. Uh, Dimeje got his uh, PhD um, from Carnegie Mellon in uh, a discipline called transition design. Uh, while he was there, uh, uh, he worked, I, I worked, had the real great fortune of being able to work with him on a bunch of um, his ideas and some collaborations. Um, on things like uh, commoning and um, recommoning and allyship uh, in uh, the importance of, of kind of creating communities in order to support ecosystemic uh, effects. So I'm excited to have this conversation with him today. May J. Yes, and hello everybody. Um, I am also, it's funny that uh, Jabe said that uh, because I'm also really Excited to be here. I see Jabe as just as he sees me. I see him as a really wonderful uh, friend and co-collaborator. But one of the things I really like about Jabe is just his mind. He has such a great mind and he kind of it does a great job at elevating my thinking around some of these concepts and some of the work that I have done. Um, and also around just random stuff, you know, I need the mind I always kind of go to and say, Dave, okay, how do we think about this problem? And he, he helps to find clarity from complexity. So, um, I'm really happy to be doing this with him. All right. So let, let, let us get into it. Dimeji. Great. So, so, you know, I want to start here and just kind of tell you a little bit about how we think about the commons or how I specifically think about the commons. Uh, so the commons is said to occupy the space between privately held property and public goods. So there's not only resource uh, systems, whose, they are not only resource system, systems that we over exploit that might lead to depletion, but the commons also includes communities using these resources and the social practices that define how these resources are used. So, however, some resources do not fit in, in that neat definition, but they're nonetheless very important to our collective well-being. So, for these resources, what we have to think about is how they are shared, not necessarily how these resources might be used only. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, when we talk about the commons, and when I chat about the commons with a lot of people, what they usually refer to is um, Garrett Harding. And it's um, justifiably so, because he was one of the first people that argued in uh, theory, at least that we remember, um, about uh, the selfish human behavior depleting common resources. So he wrote that in his book, uh, essay in 1968, titled The Tragedy of the Commons. And he felt that that happens to the point of destroying the commons. So in other words, Hardin believed that the different interests of exploiters and common resources caused them to protect their selfish rights in their own interest. So he wanted to establish a scarcity theory around the commons. And he also believed that privatization and government oversight are the vital ways for it to be able to maintain these resources and avert what he calls a tragedy. Uh, the next slide, please. So, it's important for us to note here that Hardin often perpetuated an anti-immigration and nat nativist agenda. So you see that he leveraged his relative prominence 
as a respected academic in at UC Santa Barbara to rail against immigration. He believed that that's one of the reasons for overpopulation in the U.S. And he saw this as an existential threat and always peddled this, uh, what some people call studio science that leverage exclusionary agendas and emphasize bordering and enclosure tactics. So you could understand that this is his perspective on the commons and this is where he's coming from. The next uh, slide, please. So, but when we look at Eleanor Ostrom, um, someone I, I actually really, whose work I really admire, um, and others, they point to a perspective of the commons that privileges human cooperation instead. So Ostrom claims that the solution to overconsumption in the commons is not driven by access limitation uh, through external regulatory forces like Hardin believed, but instead through internal governance and stewardship mechanisms. So if we look at Ostrom's work, she sees that she lays out these things that she called design principles. And I always share that, you know, if you think about them in a businessy kind of way, they're more like lagging indicators. Uh, they are not design principles as, um, for example, UX designers will think about them, but they show the essential ingredients that um, indicate the success of using common pool resources in institutions. So these principles help sustain the commons. In other words, everyone plays their part uh, to keep the system stable, including human. Um, and I actually, in my work, kind of started thinking about non-human participants as well. So um, Ostrom has some quite interesting foundational work as well prior to her work on the commons that Jabe is going to touch on much later in that discussion. So when we think about Hardin's work, and Ostrom's work, Hardin, for example, thought about the antidote to the tragedy of the commons is external governance mechanisms on one side and privatization on the other side. So we see real, some real world examples that demonstrate the limitations of this notion. For example, if we look at the draconian copyright and patent laws, or even the adverse effects of totalitarianism, uh, we see artificial enclosures that are being built that are, uh, limit access to new ideas. So in other words, while Hardin may be right on overexploitation of common pool resources, he's dead wrong on the centralized need or the need for decentralized government or the need of privatization to that extent. And so, you know, so as we're thinking about regulating the commons, we really want to think about the commons existing in between. So if we were to adopt Ostrom's model instead, we see that a more open source approach to sharing common pool resources is more consistent with the way he was thinking about it. Because then it allows the community, uh, and I know that um, you, was, you were sharing a little bit, um, Diane, about community is more important than contributors. But so when we think about this model, it allows the community to build the rules. And and then all the government does or governmental uh, rules does is to build, provide oversight and to actually build constitutional constitutional rules around where the community can be formed. And so when we think of so legal structures of licenses then can be foundational, but they're not enough. So it's not act, it does not actually create the commons. So Legal structures in software engineering might be open to so, um, uh, might be open source licenses, for example, and the licenses may say that this thing cannot be privatized. But the fact, or the real fact, is that it can be. Uh, the fact that it can be privatized does not make it more of a commons. It just makes it not privatizable. Cool. So um, when we look at things like um, licenses, we can say that uh, they establish the conditions that may make a commons possible, but they don't actually create a commons by fiat, right? They don't, they don't do it automatically. Um, and we can say in general that uh, things like licensure or uh, governing bodies uh, can can work at multiple levels inside of an, of of a commons, um, and Ostrom identifies these three different levels that that things may work on uh, a constitutional level, uh, which would enable uh, the conditions of possibility. So, for instance, open source licensure uh, 
enables um, open source commons to work or enables them to exist, but it does not guarantee that they will exist. It just creates the possibility of them existing. In order for a uh, commons to actually arise, there's two extra levels of negotiation that needs to occur. So uh, one would be the, uh, the collective choice level, um, which tends to be polycentric. Um, a lot of the previous conversation we heard in the last keynote revolved around these types of ideas of um, multiple organizations banding together, each with their own needs. That's the polycentrism. There's no central control mechanism. There's no one organization that is making specific demands that the rest of the organizations have to um, listen to. So there's a uh, there's a collective choice that needs to be made. And so what are the rules that are being negotiated uh, and, and what are the outcomes and, and uh, evaluation criteria of those rules at that kind of uh, collective choice layer? And then finally, uh, moving down closer to day-to-day -day activities, uh, operational level uh, decisions about how things might uh, work uh, in production and use where uh, in this case, I mean literally the production of the common resource um, itself. So rules about uh, how people can contribute code, uh, what it means to um, uh, provide a patch, how those patches should work. All, all of those details are about uh, the negotiation of how a community works together on a, a detailed level in a day-to-day -day, uh, way. Um, and the important, uh, the last important thing to kind of point out here from, from Ostrom's work is to the extent that a commons is, uh, arises from a constitutional set of rules, um, it will only survive if it has what, uh, a quality that she calls adaptive governance. And adaptive governance roughly is the idea that um, all three levels of these uh, these rules that are established and um, help uh, uh, create the commons, these negotiations, all of them have specific types of outcomes, and all of them um, then need to be evaluated according to the uh, values of the of the commons itself in order to determine whether or not those outcomes were valuable or not. And then finally. Uh, the outcomes and the evaluations should feed back into the policy creation and negotiation processes. So uh, to the extent that um, uh, bodies governing com uh, commons um, fail to uh, listen to and respond to the feedback, uh, they become maladaptive, they ossify, they, they become brittle. And to the extent that they uh, listen to uh, the community's needs and modify the um, policies at all three of these levels, they 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 create a condition of adaptive capacity. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to point out really quickly as we kind of talk through this, which is uh, there's a specific kind of license that I think actually embeds in the licensing uh, a, a quality of uh, establishing a commons. Um, and it, it is the beerware license, um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but the point uh, I'm trying to make here is that in commons theory, um, there's, there's an idea about reciprocity and reciprocity um, is often modeled or talked about in the way that one talks about buying the next round of beer um, so uh, a transactional view or a transactional governance system often thought of as kind of a privatized governance system um, and potentially a centralized governance system um, tend to be transactional. And what I mean by transactional is that uh, if I were to buy Demeje a beer and then I immediately took out a notebook and wrote down exactly how much that beer cost and I said to Demeje, you, you owe me $5 because I got, bought you that beer, that would be a transactional interaction. Um, and one of the things that happens in those transactions is that the temporality of the experience is quite compressed. It means that, uh, that there's no need for us to continue to, to negotiate at all. There's no need for us to create a community around that interaction because the transaction has 
captured what is due both sides. Recipro reciprocity is the idea that, that, that not writing that down basically establishes an ongoing negotiation between, um, between Demege and myself where it's never clear exactly how much is owed to either side, only that we will continue to interact with each other and that somehow that interaction will create a fair outcome. So I, I like the beer license because it embeds this idea that the contribution will be recognized at some other time and that other time is not specified or uh, overly constrained. Hey, Jake. Yeah, great. So what we're thinking about, you know, transaction, you know, you know, commons ex existing with transactions, you know, we won't think of commons as performative, right? They're revealed in negotiation. I just had uh, Jay mentioned reciprocity. And as, as they're revealed in negotiation and reciprocity, the community engages to solve their real problems. So for co uh, common in to emerge, there must be a social uh, dilemma. And a social dilemma, when you think about it, is an action situation where there is always a conflict that is happening between the individual and collective interest. So there, in that sense, the, the commoners are negotiating the way that they share these resources and, and making sure that their individual selfish needs are somewhat subservient to the overall collective good. Next one, please. So, um, Charlotte has someone whom I've met and I really, I not only think she's a lovely person, but I love her work. She co-authored many papers with Eleanor Ostrom on the commons. And, and in her work, she identified these six common entry points for what she calls the new commons dis discourse. So the first one, the need to be able to protect the resource from enclosure, uh, which we've kind of alluded to in, um, so far. The, uh, secondly, the observation or action of peer production and mass collaboration, primary in electronic media. Uh, the evidence of new types of tragedies of the commons that we might see in the world. Some of uh, the work that I'm doing with um, uh, another co-collaborator, Kaki Scott, talks about micro Um Then the desire to build uh, civic education and commons-like thinking. And the identification of new evolving types of commons. And finally, a rediscovery of the commons. So in my work, I proposed a seventh entry point, and, and the one that I kind of tagged design enabled with common in. Um, and I think it allows us to understand the commons a little bit differently. And this is the one that has to do with reclaiming a previously privatized and closed or com uh, commodified resource, property or system that we think is essential to our collective survival. So the factors that determine recommoning are pretty clear, at least from my perspective. Firstly, the resource or the prob uh, property being recommoned is existing already currently within the wrong governance structure. So by wrong, I mean that the governance structure where the resources uh, that, that we're talking about has the resource been either exploited to a point of depletion or fully excluded from those that might need it. Uh, second, the recommending shifts the paradigm on resource negotiation to focus on the negotiating itself. So the in in recommending signifies something that's happening continuously, so a continuous reclaiming of the process. Uh, third, the participatory roles embodied in the commoners engaged in this recommending are being drawn from conflict management and resource sharing traditions that be uh, actually sometimes beyond the ones around us. And they're not just those traditions within the commons, but also leverage other approaches to negotiation. So sometimes I actually draw some non-Western approaches as well. Fourth, relationships through which these resources might be negotiated are critical to the negotiation itself. So I actually think in terms of the different roles that the participants embody, um, and it, sometimes they're human and sometimes they're non-human. And finally, revealing micro reclaiming acts that are visible in everyday practice. 
So, um, you know, because I'm a designer, I'm going to bring some designing into this the conversation. Um, so exploring recovering, I created this set of cards that I, I use to help collectives think, start to understand how they might think about certain resources, um, um, norms and secrets that they're willing to share and all the value measurements that might be available to them differently. I call these cards prompts. Uh, the, the mandate for the designer using these prompts is to be problem revealers as opposed to problem solvers um, as we traditionally think of designers and, and to be able to help build those platforms that absorb the changing perspectives and experiences and interactions. So these cards, the ones you can see here, uh, the pattern ca cards, and so they are groundwork for identifying what I call patterns and recovering from common resources that rely on not only perceivable part, part whole dynamics of the commons or within the negotiation, but also integrates other cultural insights into understanding these um, new resources that we're talking about. And then we have different role cards, which identify the different owners and the participants and peers and partners of the commons platforms. And I was able to identify, at least in my work, up to six different roles that I embodied in the negotiation. Um, and so I have the steward in commoner, an upstream ally, I'm exploiting commoner, the scribe, the town prior, and the oracle, which kind of represents data. So, and if we were to go to the next slide, on the back of these cards or these prompts, I actually think about the different modalities of access and stewardship uh, that have to do with the boundaries, the way they're formed, collective agency, actors that might be human and non human and the different needs and expectations of the various role participants. And then I had finally uh, the next slide. Uh, these I called the dilemma cards that present the action arena prompts, which allow commoners to engage with the problems relating to resource sharing. So a good example of one way that I use that, and I've used them in different capacities, is I, I did some workshopping with landlords and Portland and um, landlords and tenants in the Portland area, Portland, Oregon to better understand issues that relate to negotiating resources and sharing information around tenancy. Uh, so uh, the Portland Tenants United is an organization I work with. They had a territorial impact that affected over 50,000 renters in the air metro area. And some of these negotiations actually led to some, some of the policy changes around rental housing in the region. For example, it influenced uh, some of the languages used in the, uh, uh, the amendment uh, that PTU suggested to Portland's relocation ordinance in uh, 2017 that provided protections uh, to tenants facing no cause evictions. So, um, so I also th started thinking about um, data and uh, thinking about data as perceivable as a commons resource because open data is not only exploitable to the point of failure, but the implication of its use also permeates to everyday life and also mark our collective livelihood. So I did, I worked in different contexts, but I want to, I'm going to share some work that talks about data driven approaches to delivering data as a needed resource and to provide a more honest narrative that actually drive the way we visualize um, common challenges such as housing insecurity, homelessness and, and stuff and, and so forth. The next slide, please. Before I do that, I actually want to share um, some of the work a good friend of my Mimi Onoha does uh, that kind of tries to find missing data sets for the benefit of the community. So through our work, Mimi looks at blank spots and in spaces that are otherwise data saturated. And she looks at data that's either obscured or that should exist where they don't. So it speaks to the value of ensuring that the people that actually do the data, that you have representation of data that's more egalitarian by nature. Next slide, please. So, um, I worked briefly with an organization called Hack Oregon. They build platforms to engage individual contributors, demystify open data by helping to find solutions to some social dilemmas experienced in the city of Portland. 
So when I worked with them, the focus was to contextualize housing related data in Portland, because Portland, Oregon is a city that I was experiencing and still is experiencing uh, significant rises in housing pricing, as well as a glut in affordable housing, including rental housing. So Hack Oregon worked to create an action arena or problem space around housing in order to synthesize the complex information on housing market and provide better vision for long-term affordability. So uh, a tenancy advocates group such as the Portland Tenants Union United use the data on housing as evidence to support their agenda. So unfortunately, the data that they draw is usually inconclusive and sometimes unreliable in terms of the sources. So for example, some realtor data was claiming then that up to five, 400 single family homes um, used as rentals were being put up for sale since tenant relocation policy was put into effect. But this data did not account for short-term rentals uh, on Airbnb, for example. And this false data often impacted the credibility of that organization. So Hack Oregon was able to tap into housing uh, study data made available to them, which is, was considered to be more reliable. I actually I think it came out of Harvard. And they extended that data to be able to tell better stories through visualization. But they not only did that, they pulled data from other sources, such as the Natural, National Institute of Standards uh, Tech, NIST, as well as Smart City, Cities Global Initiative. And they used these sources to create standards for normalizing open data and putting this data in, store, in stores to ensure consistency on how they are read and contextualized. And then this contextualization allowed the data to be grouped to allow for connections to be easily made between data sets and to make information from the data more conclusive and easier to act on. So the work also allowed for data to be more egalitarian in its use. So the, um, the next slide, please. So when we look at the challenges with um, data uh, recombining, we see that there's some misunderstandings on the implications of accessing open data, which leads to improper dishonest uses of open data, uh, including individual or corporate exploitation. So openness should not always mean access. So expertise is needed with open data, especially in terms of its stewardship. And then privacy and security laws need, need to be there to ensure transparency and collaboration. And then thinking about the right uh, versus uh, the wrong data and finding accountability measures for misuse and improper privatization. And then we always have problems of pure, pure uh, poorly curated data as well, which is a big issue. So I'm going to hand over to, um, to Dave now. Cool. Uh, so one of the reasons I really wanted Demetri to talk a little bit about uh, data recombining was, uh, I think, is a really interesting example of uh, the way that we could think of what the common resource is, uh, it, if we it, and apply the rules that we are trying to figure out and the things that we're trying to um, explore, where in, in open source communities. So open source communities, the resource tends to be the source code. That's why we point to open source. Um, and some of the questions I end up having um, around that are what could we do as a community uh, to help make open data better? Um, and in particular, uh, the fact that data, unlike source code, uh, has a un uh, another and a unique sets of problems uh, as a public resource. Uh, that that source code tends to to, to avoid uh, having. Um, so I think there's so, a lot of interesting things to explore there. And I, I think both from a um, uh, an under, better understanding of how um, commons theory could be applied to governmental data at uh, at your local government level, at at state and and uh, nation level um, issues. But also, frankly, inside of corporations, uh, one of the one of the real big issues that we can see is um, if if a platform is uh, thought of as primarily being source code, uh, 
the, the things that uh, we kind of look at inside of DNCF and things like that, the, that would tend to, the resource would tend to be uh, uh, source code in operation. But in fact, a huge amount of what makes platforming work or not work inside of organizations is the fact that there's massive amounts of siloed data in large enterprises and the negotiation and renegotiation of where that data should live and how it should be governed um, are real issues that uh, I think enterprises struggle with. So I think there's multiple different places uh, where we could use this thinking about commons to, uh, to rethink how we manage things. Um, and, and I don't think it's just source code. And I think that this community um, that we're talking to probably has a good deal of, uh, of insight to contribute to things like that. So uh, from that perspective, uh, I just wanted to really quickly kind of walk through some of the points that, that Demeje made and make sure that they're uh, cl as clear as can be. Um, one of the things to say is just that uh, there, is, there is not a, um, an a absolute ethical standard that commoning is better than other things. There are things that are better managed by governance and by privatization. The question ends up being, what are the types of resources and the types of relationships that would create greater value by creating a commons? Um, and in particular, uh, Demeji and I, uh, I think, uh, have, have a pretty uh, strong agreement that a commons can't actually be designed. The only thing that a commons can uh, the only thing that, that designers and, and, and people wanting to create a commons can do is create the conditions for a commons to arise. Um, and that's because a commons uh, specifically uh, is, is an activity that reveals the underlying complexity of various negotiations around uh, the use of shared resources. And by revealing that complexity, you are either going to create a community around it to handle that complexity, or you're going to react and try to simplify the complexity either into something that can be privatized or can be centrally governed. Um, so uh, that being said, um, you know, we see a set of patterns around how things that could be uh, more valuable treated as a common resource we see a set of patterns of how they, how those resources end up in other forms of governance. Um, and, and those four ones that we've identified so far are either they were placed, the, the, the resource was placed into um, privatization or governance without an understanding of, of commons. In other words, these are acts of omission. It's the idea that um, the person or the groups deciding how to uh, distribute these resources or govern these resources, we're unaware of commons as a, as a way of governing. Um, there's anti-commons in, in particular, the idea that um, we shouldn't have these kind of self-governing um, systems or that we shouldn't allow for community engagement and that um, kind of a, a Hobbesian version of if you let the, if you let the people uh, manage themselves, they'll run amok. Um, so that is more of an error of commission. In other words, a, an attempt to eliminate commons for either um, either uh, bad philosophical reasons and or for, pro for uh, profit reasons. Um, uh, the other one we see is things that start as uh, privatized resources, um, but then need to be common. So this is more around a negotiation of things uh, where when should a resource that has started out, uh, appropriately started out as a private resource be commons? Uh, when, when should it be moved into a commons? Uh, and finally, um, there's the idea that uh, things that were in a commons could be degraded, uh, they could collapse into um, either private or centralized governance because the actual community processes and activities that were supporting the commons themselves erode and therefore the resources um, migrate to other uh, areas, uh, other forms of governance in order to be continued to be managed. Um, 
when we talk about recombining, then what, 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 what we mean by it, or what I would suggest we mean by it, is that we want to first recognize that some resources are more valuable as common resources. We need to determine the qualities of those resources um, and, and in order to be able to locate them, then we need to locate such resources either in privatized or centralized governance um, uh, and then negotiate uh, uh, that ongoing negotiation that the major report uh, pointed to in order to uh, recommon or make these resources back into a commons resource. So this is in essence the uh, what I think of as being recommoning. Um, recommoning is the process by which we reveal the complexity of various stakeholder needs and we create the conditions to enable a commons to arise. So that I would differentiate from um, commoning itself, the activity of uh, maintaining a commons. Um, and again, uh, to beat that dead horse, uh, it's not a set of policies, but an activity. It's a process, an ongoing process that maintains and reproduces the commons um, over time. And Ostrom gives us these nice eight rules, um, or as Demeje pointed out earlier, kind of design properties or qualities that one might look for in order to determine whether or not a commons is going to, um, to be effective or is going to be sustainable, including clear group boundaries, uh, benefits being equivalent to cost, um, et cetera. I, I don't need to read the slide to you guys, but these are the eight that um, we, we, we would look for in order to determine whether the commons is stable or uh, should be expected to be stable. On the other hand, she also identifies um, threats to commons. In other words, ways in which the commons themselves collapse, um, rapid exogenous changes. In other words, um, the environment or the market in which the commons uh, kind of exists uh, within uh, has some sort of change can cause um, a, it can challenge the adaptive capacity of the uh, governance of uh, the commons itself. Transmission failures. So uh, when 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 a commons is handed from one group of individuals to another group of individuals, a failure to translate or to help the next generation of leadership understand um, what uh, the governing uh, was based on in the first place. So this is uh, whenever there are transitions or um, leadership transformations. Uh, it, it's important to notice this and to manage the transition from one uh, regime to another regime. Um, programs that rely on blueprint thinking and easy access to external funds. Again, uh, when we treat things as being simple as opposed to complex, what we would expect to see is that uh, the value of the commons would degrade because it, the value of the commons is not simply in the resources, but it's in the negotiation of the resources that actually creates the value. Um, corruption and opportunistic behavior. And then a, a whole set of things that I think um, are things that uh, I heard in the last conversation, I hear many conversations, including being able to explore, ex, expose uh, uh, accurate information, uh, reduce conflicts and have conflict resolution mechanisms that people agree upon, um, creating educational uh, facilities, which we heard a little bit about in the last presentation as well. Um, and then um, the last one has to do with these exogenous changes. So uh, how how is the organizations managing the commons creating resilience by creating some sort of capacity for absorbing those changes? Then I, I just have two more thoughts and then we're gonna do Ask Me Anything. Um, the first thought is this, um, given the current state of the world, I think um, a, a brief uh, application of commons theory to what's happening right now and, uh, and through Ostrom's own work could be useful to think through. The first thing is to say that Ostrom's um, first work prior to the commons and one of the ways that she came to understand the commons uh, 
um, and the importance of community engagement in their uh, and, and self-organization it was her study of police forces in the United States. And in, in those studies, um, what she found uh, was very interesting. In particular, um, aggressive policing uh, has a feedback loop that dampens uh, the ability for uh, the communities that those that are being policed to uh, clearly express themselves and um, to control the police forces uh, in, in, to such an extent that even adding more and more laws and disciplinary effects into the feedback loop doesn't actually improve um, the performance of the police uh, in relationship to the communities. And this, this has a, a specific uh, kind of action. Um, and the action in particular um, is that uh, as, as police departments grow in size and uh, create higher and higher uh, amounts of hierarchy, um, the accuracy of information reported up those um, hierarchies is decreased. Um, the other thing that ends up happening is that citizens become uh, unaware of the individuals that are policing them um, and they don't have direct interactions with them, so they can't create effective pressure on those, uh, those police forces. Um, and the result of that ends up being that informal control of police officers, in other words, the community's uh, social norms as a way of controlling policing. So uh, you can imagine people standing on streets shouting uh, at police officers not to kill them and things like this. So those are informal controls. They're not legal controls. They're the community expressing something specific. Those informal controls in these larger and larger police forces end up being less and less effective. Um, and so uh, the result of that is kind of a, a, a feedback loop that amplifies um, destructive behavior um, around the uh, communities that the police are supposed to be um, protecting. So uh, the, the result of this is kind of a rapid divergence and a collapse of the commons, uh, um, uh, where the commons in this case is uh, expressed by um, people's common security needs. Um, Ostrom was very specific in her findings about this. Um, she she stated that she ne has never found um, a good example of a, um, a higher paid police for, uh, uh, she's never found a correlation between increasing the amount and funding, uh, amount of police officers and funding of police officers with the quality of uh, the community's perception of security um, and therefore uh, their ability to create a commons around their own self-organized security. So she did find the opposite of this, uh, which was that smaller organizations uh, tended to create the space needed for uh, communities to uh, not only create their own self-policing, in other words, the reduction of crime by actual uh, citizens working to create better conditions and reduce uh, the likelihood of crime, um, but also uh, the feedback loops required in order to make sure that the police forces were under, um, under uh, the control of the communities that they were supposed to be um, managing. And so what she says basically is that the problem with a lot of current attempts to control, well, actually this is in the 70s, but uh, a lot of the uh, uh, problems with uh, trying to control policing are, are simply based on the fact that they over rely on what police departments can do in order to improve law enforcement. And they don't focus enough on what citizens can do as co-producers of uh, community security. Um, and that a shift from uh, uh, increasing uh, control of police forces as opposed to increasing uh, community interaction uh, in order to create safety um, is, is an underexplored avenue. Um, the, other, the last point that I want to make really quickly um, is this. Um, Ostrom uh, 
Ostrom's view of the commons um, has a, a very particular problematic uh, that I think is worth pointing out and exploring really briefly. And what it is is this, Ostrom's ideas of commons um, and communities are based in a, a basic observation, which is that communities are more likely to form if the individuals in those communities have homogenous views. Uh, in other words, people, you know, birds of a feather flock together is what we're trying to say here. Um, and, and this is not good or bad necessarily. However, what we end up seeing is that communities that are heterogeneous have a harder time establishing commons. And there's some really pernicious um, outcomes with this particular observation. And, and one of the things to say is that at these various levels that we discussed where rules, norms, and policies are formed, uh, we can see if there's if the originators of these uh, various levels, the people who are involved in the original versions of these policies, for instance, um, were homogenous, there is a chance that those, uh, those uh, individuals could have encoded uh, racist, sexist, biased uh, thoughts, processes into the various levels inside the, of these different parts of the organization. Um, and the result of that um, is what we would call institutional racism and sexism. And commons itself does not resolve this problem because it does not offer a way to think through how to create a commons out of more heterogeneous concerns. So uh, what will tend to occur uh, without active engagement or active attempts to reduce this is that uh, the homogeneous uh, majority will remove or erase or exclude uh, the other views uh, from the commons and therefore uh, that exclusion um, leaves uh, some people out of the, uh, uh, of the equation as we could say, as we might say, uh, resulting in institutional racism and sexism Cism. Uh, and so uh, I think Demeje and I both would, would argue that allyship uh, becomes a critical component of any individuals who uh, would like to be involved in uh, the active creation of uh, rules, uh, constitutional uh, and uh, collective agreement rules, especially, um, and that uh, allyship involves uh, using the privileged position that you get from being a member of the majority, um, making sure that uh, honest voices are heard in the commons and that not, uh, that, the, uh, the, that the commons are not overwhelmed by um, particular uh, viewpoints um, and that uh, non-homogeneous non, non, uh, viewpoints aren't erased. Um, to be, oh, I'm not forwarding the slides, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, and that finally, uh, we need to build pa uh, these platforms uh, to actively empower others. Um, and uh, ideally, uh, we want to encourage um, people involved in creating commons to refuse to uh, stay silent about the uh, erasure and, and um, subjugation of other peoples. Um, so just a last uh, thing, um, when we look at this and we look at this multiple level idea inside of commons, we end up with a structure that says that when we are allying with people, we can ally with them at multiple levels for multiple purposes. So we could ally with an individual in order to make sure that their work is seen uh, at, in an institution. We could also ally uh, with a cultural group in order to reduce um, individual oppression. Uh, so all of these different levels and these interactions offer opportunities uh, for allies to um, exercise their privilege in order to uh, make sure that uh, the work and contributions of people um, who are not um, 
uh, not viewed as being part of the commons can then be um, invited into the commons in a way that their viewpoints are not necessarily integrated, but that their uh, arguments and um, needs are considered um, inside of the commons uh, and therefore maybe improve the commons for uh, a greater group of individuals. So I think that's us. Well, let me just tell you, that was a uh, tour de force and um, uh, a wonderful thing. And I think you've just um, pointed out a new hero for me, uh, Eleanor Ostrom. I'm going to be, I, I had, wasn't aware of her work before today. So I think we all have a lot of uh, homework and reading up on um, her. Uh, unfortunately, I think I checked on Wikipedia and she's passed away, so I can't make her come and talk. So thank you. Yeah. Um, for for doing that, I was really like, oh goodness, could we can we get her on next? Yeah, if I could add, Diane, she was the first woman, if I if I if I if I believe, to get the um, the um, the economics equivalent of the Nobel 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 Prize. She got she got the she got the first first woman to get a Nobel Prize in economics. Yes, wow. yes, yes. I, I yeah, I don't know that it's quite. I don't know that they quite have a Nobel Prize in economic economics, but. It's that, right? Yeah, she was the first one to get it. Yeah. So I, there's, it's really, and I'm going to unmute um, my my co-moderator here, uh, Daniel, um, in case he wants to add anything in. And a couple, uh, Lisa Marie, there's a couple of folks who've been chattering in the background too um, about this. But I think that the work that you're doing is incredibly impactful and informs a lot of the work that we as community developers are doing. And um, so thank you very much for, for doing this um, and helping. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, Ed, and I always have to uh, preface this, is that um, OpenShift Commons um, is not, was not created by a uh, community. It is a, uh, an informal structure that we have um, and we put in place. And you know, it, an aspirational goal is for it to be an actual commons. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm not trying to self-aggrandize by talking about commons when I we labeled OpenShift Commons, but it is an aspirational goal to get there um, and to have some of these um, infrastructure and processes in place. Um, one of the questions that I, that I have for you, and that I think it is, it, it go, revolves around, um, and 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 you talked about the allyship and the diversity is the and the homogeneity usually of um, forming a commons. Um, you know that you that they're usually more successful if um, they're everybody thinks alike or looks alike or is from the same background or whatever. And what uh, and and you know there's so many things that came up today. Um, but one of the things that we all struggle with is, um, especially in open source, is this idea of um, meritocracy um, and and how that influences our ideas about. Um, how a project should be governed, who should be the um, the people that are the, considered the experts or putting the governance in place. And, and I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe what I would call the myth of meritocracy and um, how to create more open um, governance. And, and I love the... I love the phrase that you had about problem revealers as well, Nemeji. I think that I want that card and that deck of cards for every everything that I go to. But I, I think that this is one of the things, um, the meritocracy um, and the adaptive governance concepts are, so, are something that I'd like to hear a little bit more you guys talk about. Yeah, so I can I can start and briefly um, give a quick response and then Jabe can extend that a little bit. So one of the things we think about, and we always go, Jib and I have been going back and forth on these ideas for a while now. <laughs> and one of the things we think about uh, from other work is that uh, diverse systems are resilient systems. And being able to actually think in terms of introducing diversity. Um, so one of the, I, I was thinking about one of the patterns in some of the work that I was doing is permeability of the boundaries that you form. So in other words, ensuring that the right voices are brought in is absolutely crucial and fundamental when you think about um, common in as a practice. Um, and so one of the, um, I think one of the ways you do that, at least from the designerly standpoint, is that you acknowledge different 
forms and different levels of expertise. So you always leverage expertise and be aware that expert, expertise presents itself in different forms. And so, and being able to have, um, think in terms of like governance and, and ensuring that representation, that, that the governance is representative of the people that are the core uh, participants or the commoners in the commons is uh, absolutely crucial. But then I'll, I'll, I'll see if Jabe has some thoughts around expanding that a little bit. So I, I think one of the things that I would point out really quickly is around expertise in particular, is that um, experts and managers are, are um, usually thought of in an efficiency mindset. And what I mean by that is that the reason you bring in an expert is to make a decision quickly. And the reason why you elevate one expert over another expert is again, because by elevating them, you can reduce the friction inside of an organization. You can basically say, you know, what, whenever we're going to make a decision about DNSs, Demage gets to make the final call. You can talk about it all you want, but Demage is the one who makes the final call. It means that Demage can actually just kind of cut the baby in two whenever he wants, and that that results in faster decision making, right? So all of this is based in an efficiency theory, where the whole point is to make the organization move faster, think faster, act faster. One of the arguments of a commons is that it's not an efficiency-based play. It's not an attempt to make uh, decision making more efficient. It's actually a, an attempt to recognize the complexity of needs of different individuals inside of the inside of the commons group, and therefore it doesn't make it more efficient. It actually makes those conversations uh, maybe possibly take longer. A result of that efficiency thinking and the relationship between that and and meritocracy uh, often ends up being um, that uh, we measure individuals based on some sort of a, objective measurement um, in order to prove that they are the experts or not. And the result of that ends up being a, uh, a shift from kind of these discourse-based negotiations about how, how we would negotiate an agreement to a centralized me governing mechanism where we determine who the expert is based on some sort of standardized system um, or um, or, or however you might think of that. Um, so I think, um, I think to, to the, a certain extent, the question is uh, how how does one um, in a meritocracy um, recognize that the meritocracy itself is designed for a specific reason, and that's not good or bad. But when we are trying to uh, increase uh, the requisite variety inside the organization um, and, and increase, um, I increase the differences uh, in order to, uh, to make the organization better, uh, that meritocracy is actually probably usually counterproductive. We, we've also, we also hear, uh, I, I think, a mantra within, you know, open source and Red Hat and other organizations is that Having homogeneous um, groups doesn't, uh, you, know, you don't get a lot of innovation in that as well. Yeah. So it is this whole dynamic of innovation um, being driven by different opinions as well and different aspects. So there's, there's a lot of nuances to the whole um, conversation around um, bringing people in to the community, having their voices heard. So it's, it's this is, we have like, I don't know, I'm, I'm giving us, for four more minutes to have this uh, conversation. I'm wondering if Daniel or uh, Lisa Marie had, had something that they wanted to, to bring up. Well, I actually have a question um, for Jabe and Dementi, and thank you for your amazing presentation. Um, I was just listening to the, the Hidden Brains podcast that aired on um, the 12th, just a couple of days ago, and they make a lot of the same points about um, the role the community plays, the unconscious bias role the community plays to, um, you know, be an indicator of the unconscious bias and activities of the sea in police forces and things like that. So it's a fascinating podcast called The Air We Breathe. Um, if you want some data that was from the IAT test that wasn't 50 years old, uh, I, I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, but my question for you, since you have a lot of community organizers um, and community members on this call today, um, what are you doing specifically with this data and how are you 
um, you know, putting it back into recommon the communities and the work can we specifically do as community organizers? Dimenshi? <laughs> Dave? Okay. okay, great. So I think in terms of, uh, sorry, I, I, in terms of like my work, I think the, the, you know, the work in terms of like the data specifically what's been done there um, is um, actually I have since shifted away to other work. So I, I was actually not deeply entrenched in that. I have to make sure that I'm, I, 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 I say that pretty clearly. So my work was tangential to that. So I was a researcher working with that team. So I was embedded in, in the team and working closely with them. So, but I, you know, and I, I'll go out on a limb and say, so a lot of the work that's been done with um, with Hack Oregon, which is a case that I shared with you, is still being carried forward. So the 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 you know the data that's been um, um, that's been bucketed and contained and 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 contextualized, it's been shared directly with the community. So they have um, Hack Oregon has a platform and he has it's actually. Um, Works closely with a, as a group of um, community activists with, uh, that actually visualizes the data and puts it out there in the community. So that's still ongoing, um, but it's not work I'm directly connected to. So um, not anymore, at least. Uh, so, um, but it's still it's uh, it's uh, very very much community facing. They've actually built a broader civic organization that actually governs how that data is shared as well. I think, I think another really quick comment would, uh, that I would make is uh, that policing shows some of these negative feedback loops, these pernicious feedback loops. And one of them is that over policing of people of color creates more data about people of color than people uh, who, are, who are white. Yeah. And the result of that is that people then start making arguments about where criminality lays based on the amount of data available, which is a skewed data set to begin with because of the original governing and operating procedures that created the data to begin with. And so in, in, in result, you end up having to have the activity of commonings there, the activity of recommoning there is to re-problematize the data set in a way that people see that it's not objective. And, and therefore it can't be used as a way of negotiating a more secure system because it doesn't accurately represent the system in the first place. And things like that that we see throughout organizations in different ways where people uh, kind of claim to be being objective because they have data when they have not examined the way in which the data has been produced and reproduced in the first place is one of the reasons why this uh, activity of commenting, thinking mm -hmm. about data, thinking about how data can be opened and uh, whether or not it is biased or not ends up becoming incredibly difficult to work with, but incredibly important. And I think, you know, that goes mm -hmm. right down to things um, like IBM saying that they're not going to do facial recognition anymore because of things exactly like this. Um, yep. And those are the governing decisions that will actually create new conditions and prevent the creation of this biased data in the first place and and that's stuff that we need to look at yeah and if i can add to that um, um someone once said that the d data bears the truth that you give it and i i actually worked closely with um you know another academic uh dr jo joanna bonert on we we kind of investigated um design um design as symbolic violence and symbolic violence is um is a term that was co coined by pierre Bourdieu that talks about the in, imperceptible forms of uh, power, um, forms of violence that are caused by power differentials and power in, in differences within uh, uh, structures and communities and societies. And so when you think about that, just to kind of pick it back up of what Jabe was talking about, um, the representation is absolutely crucial, right? Uh, making sure that the data that you that you are presenting and you're sharing actually bears the truth that that is um, that is missing. So I shared earlier the work of Mimi Ono about the missing data sets, where where the 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 stories that are being built around the data that's being shared is not consistent because 
there's not the representation is not is not proper it's not it's improper representation there so i think it's really you know i think it's really important a really important point you you mentioned lisa Murray, making sure that that um that those forms of symbolic violences are not perpetuated by just inadequate representation and lack of diversity awesome well uh we could have another hour just on open data uh there's i have a, a group coming in a little bit later this week um, talking about a covid 19 open data project um, that's happening up here in canada and we've been having a discussion right about this too is that like the metadata around race and um you know because of healthcare and privacy issues and stuff like that they can't they don't have access to it um or if they do it's in stats canada and it's it's really you know combining data sets and to create real true um data is that's accurate and reflective of what's actually happening on the ground you see that in so many things whether it's um, policing or covid or pretty much you know any that the data um I, I love the quote that you just gave there i probably can't paraphrase it right but i think that was um dead on in terms of you know you can trust the data but you really need to understand um where it's coming from and what the biases are um in creating that and using that to judge or make decisions without knowing that is really one of the more dangerous things we can do so I can't tell you how grateful I am for this amazing conversation um, and for everybody for participating in it. Um, we're running a little bit behind today, so I am going to make you guys come back again soon um, uh, and give you, you know, another hour to, to talk about this as we have on um, Fridays, we do stuff with Jabe's team, the GTO office. So we have a forum for that on, on Friday. So um, maybe we'll just have you back again this coming Friday. To, um, I guess, Jabe makes me do things, and I do things. <laughs> that's what we like about Jabe, so that's wonderful. Um, but right now, what I'd like to do is, is say thank you very much. Um, 